Let's take a look at some camera basics inside of Cinema 4D. Now most of us use our perspective view more or less as our camera view. A lot of times we spin the view around and we kind of compose our shot inside the perspective window. So I've got these three coffee cups. I just want to compose a shot where I can see all three of them. I want something in the foreground, something in the background. So I want something that looks you know, maybe kind of like, you know, something more or less like that. That's kind of how I want my final shot to be. But right now, I'm still looking at it from the perspective window. And, you know, that's okay, but if you really want to have the ultimate control over the final outcome of your image, you really should go ahead and put a camera in the scene. When you add in a virtual camera, you'll get more control over how you compose the final shot. You can utilize things like focal length, uh, shutter speeds, and probably most importantly at the moment, uh, depth of field. Now when I add a new camera, I want to make sure my perspective view is active. Because I've already sort of roughly composed my shot in the perspective view, when I make a new camera, it will mimic what I've already got going on in terms of the angle in my perspective view, which basically means I don't have to recompose the shot from scratch. So I'm going to go into the camera icon, hit camera, you'll see, uh, in this case it's kind of large, but that's okay. Actually, it's not large, my coffee cups are kind of small. Uh, you'll see in your scene, you'll get a virtual camera. There it is, let's zoom out a little more here. Okay, there we go. And you can see it pointing at kind of a funky angle at the cups. If you look at my front view here, you can see it kind of angled looking at the cups. And, and this angle that it's pointing at mimics the angle of my perspective view. So when I made the camera, it, like I said earlier, it mimicked the perspective view. Now if I go into my perspective window, I'm actually not looking through the camera's lens just yet. I'm still looking through the perspective view. To actually look through the camera's lens, you have to go to your camera object over in the objects manager and you click this little box right here and that will put you into the camera view. Now if you want to recompose your shot, you can go into the scene and you can drag the camera around just like you would any other object. So you'll notice if I go into the front view and drag the camera up and down, you can see it booming in the perspective view. Booming is when you move your camera up and down, it booms up and down. Okay. If I dolly the camera in and out, I can grab it and I can push the camera in and out. And again, as I'm dragging it in the front view, you can see the composition change in uh, my perspective window, which is now my camera window, my active camera window. If I want a little more control over how to set up my shot, you know, I can move the camera like this, which is what I was doing previously, or if I use the view management tools, this will actually now move the camera as well. So when I zoom out of the shot and let go of my mouse button, the camera will back out of the shot. When I zoom in, the mouse button comes back in. If I move the camera, well, let's, uh, let's move it up the camera will move up here. So you can either compose the shot by manipulating the camera uh, out here in the scene, or you can do it, I find it easier to do uh, with the view management tools. It's just, I think, a little easier to do it from the camera's point of view. So let me compose my shot once again, very similar to like I had before. What's interesting about these, you know, these virtual cameras that you typically get in your 3D software packages, most of them will mimic real world cameras as closely as possible. For example, you'll have focal lengths, you'll have apertures and f-stop settings, uh, you'll have shutter speeds, you, some of them will have ISO for actually increasing the noise. Uh, they'll have a focal distance for, you know, having a focal plane so that you can then control your depth of field. So if we take a look down here, uh, one of the first options that's kind of interesting is the focal length. Well, that's the fancy word for zoom. And again, many of you, if you've, if you've had photography in the past, you might have an idea of how wide an 18 millimeter lens is versus, you know, a 200 millimeter lens. If you have a wider focal length, a wider lens, you'll get more barrel distortion and warping of the image. So if I were to click on the preset here and go to like a 15 millimeter super wide, and you'll see all of a sudden my coffee cups get small in the frame because the lens just got wider. 
if I move the camera in to compose the shot, look at all the barrel distortion I get on the cup. It's totally warped. And that's what would happen if you had a, you know, basically a cylindrical shape object on a really wide angle lens. Look at the cup in the background. Look how far away it appears to be. Again, that's what happens optically with a real camera with a wide angle lens. Now, if I go ahead and do the reverse of that, and let's try like, uh, 130, uh, 135 millimeter telephoto lens, all of a sudden my camera zooms in, so I'm really close on the cups. So let me just zoom the camera out a little bit, kind of compose a similar shot here. You'll notice the cup in the background looks a lot closer than it did earlier because it's mimicking the physics of a real camera lens. So you'll get focal length compression, optical illusions going on just like you would with a real lens. And you'll get less barrel distortion on the coffee cups, again, like you would if you were using a telephoto lens. So the standard lens size is a normal lens is considered 50 to 55 millimeters. So I'm gonna go ahead and set this to 50 millimeters. And let me just recompose my shot. And that will give me a minimal amount of barrel distortion. Our eyes typically see somewhere around 50 millimeters. That's how we're used to seeing the world. And that's why this is referred to as a normal lens because it most closely matches what our eyes see day to day. Uh, but these can be kind of fun to play around with. You can use them to really, particularly the wide angle, you'll get the same results you do with a real lens. So you can really skew the objects in your rendering. It's, it's kind of interesting. Next up, we have focal distance. Well, that lets you define a focal point, what's actually gonna be in sharp focus in the render. If I zoom out a little bit, well, in this case, I have to zoom out a lot, you'll see my camera icon is much larger than my cups. Let me zoom in here a little bit. There are my three cups, and if I zoom out, you see the, the icon here, what that represents the focal length goes all the way out here. If I click this little dot in the middle, I can adjust my focal length. Or I can go down here where it says focal distance. I'm sorry, I, didn't, I misspoke. I didn't mean to say focal length, focal distance. Uh, this is what controls the focal plane, what's gonna be in sharp focus in your rendering. So the focal distance, I can click on these little arrows and adjust it that way, just like you can with any other numeric dialogue in Cinema 4D. Or if you can get that little dot in the middle of the focal distance box here. You can drag that in as well. And I'm gonna go ahead and more or less put the focal distance on that middle cup of coffee. Just make sure, yeah, kind of like more toward the front, I suppose, than the back, but something like that. And this would be like if you were to hit the shutter halfway on your camera to focus on an object, you're defining your focal length. So I'm gonna put it right about there. So at some point, if I turn on depth of field, this cup should be in focus. And if I set up my depth, depth of field properly, uh, these other cups, the one in the background and the one in the foreground should become softer. So before I get to the next tab, you have focal length, which controls the wide angle lens versus a telephoto lens. And you've got your focal distance. Next up under the physical tab, you've got your ability to adjust your f-stop and your shutter speed. Well, I'm not doing an animation, so the shutter speed really doesn't have an outcome, uh, doesn't have an effect on the outcome of my render. The shutter speed would come into play if the objects were in motion, again, very much like a real camera. Uh, the slower the shutter speed, the more blur you would get as the objects were animating past the camera. The faster the shutter speed, the sharper those objects would render out with less blur. Now, I can't adjust my f-stop at the moment. It's all ghosted out because I have to turn on one other thing in Cinema 4D before I can start my rendering. If I go up here into my render options, the render at the moment is the standardized renderer. And in order to take advantage of all the other settings available with these cameras, all the other sort of realistic settings like the f-stop and shutter speed, we have to switch over from the standard renderer to the physical renderer. And that will add another option uh, down here for my render output. If I click on physical, I can turn on depth of field. And when I do that, it will make the f-stop over here come to life. So you gotta make sure you have that depth of field turned on. A lot of folks forget that, but it's one additional little thing you gotta do here. You gotta go to renderer, put to physical, turn on your depth of field. All right, great. Then you have your apertures, your standard apertures to pick from. Now, the thing to keep in mind is for the most part, we don't really build things to scale unless you go ahead and measure everything out. But if you don't go ahead and build things to scale, 
the camera is programmed to work like in a real world environment. So when we don't make things to scale, the apertures get a little messy. So just for giggles, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna do like an F11. An F11 is a mid-range aperture, usually gives a pretty deep, reasonably deep depth of field. So let me go ahead and render out these cups, see what we get. And your results will totally vary. You're gonna to have to play with this f-stop setting. Essentially, the rules are the same. The smaller, oh, I should say, the higher the f-stop number, the smaller the aperture, the greater the depth of field. The lower the f-stop value, the wider the aperture, the shallower the depth of field. And again, it doesn't behave, it does behave like it does in the real world. However, we don't usually build things to scale, and scale is critical when it comes to figuring out your depth of field. So time, sometimes you have to fudge the numbers quite a bit. So here I am at F11, and my rendering is slowly progressing. I can start to see that this coffee cup here appears to be in focus, okay? The one in the background is looking a little grainy and soft. The one in the foreground is looking a little soft. The blur is a little noisy because I have to turn up the anti-aliasing, but I'll do that later once I've established my, my aperture setting. So we're gonna let this render out. And there's my final render. And um, there's a little bit of blur going on here. That's not too bad. Now, if I wanted it to render out sharper, I would bring my f-stop up higher. Let's try, let's try like an f-18 and see what that gives me. And we're not gonna actually sit here and watch this render. Let's speed this up and look at the final outcome. Okay, here we are looking at the F11. This next one right here is the F18. It's getting a little bit sharper. Let's go ahead and let's try to make the depth of field even shallower. Let's go to something, ooh, I've got mail. Nah, nothing important. I should probably mute that. I always forget to shut this stuff off. Okay, so let's try to make the depth of field even shallower. Uh, let me go to a lower or a wider aperture, but a lower f-stop value. Let's do something like a 2.8. Let's give that a render. Okay, here's a final render at 2.8. You can see that this coffee cup is very much in focus, uh, but these guys are really blurry and out of focus. And again, they're really noisy. I'm gonna turn up the anti-aliasing next. But before I do that, I just wanna point out one thing with the depth of field. Don't be afraid, more often than not, the scale of these coffee cups is, is extra small, but more often than not, I go really open on the apertures. I'll go to like an F1, and sometimes if that doesn't do it, I'll get into uh, surreal numbers like 0.5 or 0.08. Oh, I totally just lost the window. Let's try that again, 0.08. If these numbers aren't working, if you go all the way to 1.0 and your image is still coming out totally sharp, try bringing this number down even farther. It's a totally surrealistic number. No camera in the world can do that. But mathematically, if the scale of your objects happens to be really large and you don't realize it, you're gonna have to bring this number down. Normally, I'm surprised the depth of field got as shallow as it did, because like I said, normally, I'm at maybe like at a 0.5 or 0.8. Oops, why is this not typing? Here we go, 0.5 or sometimes a 0.8. But anyways, you sometimes have to go below the one and get into a, a fraction there. Now, what I'm gonna do, this depth of field's a little steep for me. Let me do, let's do a 5.6 and let's bring up the anti-aliasing. So I'm gonna go into my render settings. Now, sometimes you adjust the anti-aliasing by going up to where it says anti-aliasing. And normally you go from geometry to best, but right now it's ghosted out because the settings from the physical camera override this anti-aliasing. They actually give you more finite adjustments to the anti-aliasing. So if I click on physical, really the only thing you gotta mess around with is the sample quality. Right now it's on low. I'm gonna go ahead, I think I'm gonna put it right to high. Let's close that out. And this is gonna take significantly longer to render, but it should look a lot better. And we'll be back in a few moments. Okay, folks, it finally finished. That took a little bit of time. Uh, but as you can see, it looks a lot nicer than the previous render. Here's the original one with the low quality. Here it is on high, and you can see it really softened up quite a bit. However, it did uh, sacrifice some render time. This one took, the original one took about two minutes. 
the high setting took about 33 minutes. Now, I should preface this by saying, you know, I'm on a slightly older machine. It's about four or five years old. So the processors are a little sluggish to something that if you purchased uh, recently. So your results will definitely vary. You'll, you'll most likely clock out quicker than I did here. Uh, this did take a little bit longer. But when you do jack up the quality, it does sacrifice the render time. It will take longer. 